from the button. So what is going to be left in the button click listener? Almost nothing. All right. Remember, what's the user interface's job? The user interface's job is to supply the necessary input, in this case, to play the game, and then to handle the display of the output. So we'll grab the value that the user selected. We'll give it to a, cl uh, a class. Uh, we'll create a class. We will uh, call a method on that class. We'll find out if they won or lost. And we will get back the images um, for that. So let's review what we have so far and then we will talk about what we will need to do to refactor this further. We now have oh we now have two classes. We have our main activity class and we have our die class. Let's look at the die class first. There's a notion in object-oriented design of encapsulation and that is Everything about some entity needs to be in one place. So there's nothing that a die can do should be anywhere else but here in this class. All right? And classes consist of attributes and they consist of methods. Attributes are typically just like values. Um, where there's really nothing behind it. And you can think of a method as being like a calculation or like a process. Um, I gave an example earlier, earlier today of if we had a student class. The student name, the student ID number, address, phone number, all that would be attributes. Those are characteristics of the student. But if we think of like calculate a student's GPA, that's a process that you have to go through to calculate it. All right? It's not an attribute. It's like, what's your GPA? Well, you have to do the math. You have to go out and look to see all the classes that you've taken, how many credit hours each is worth, what grade you got, and so on and so forth. Now, the idea is, is if we were doing that, we'd create a student class, and that's where that would live. And if there was a bug in it, that bug would be everywhere. But the good news is if we wanted to fix the bug, we would fix it just in one place. Likewise, if the rules changed, all right, if, for example, we started giving pluses and minuses, you know, A plus, A, A minus, instead of just A, B, C, then the rules for calculating your GPA would change too, right? Well, we wouldn't want to have to track down every, you know, multiple places in the system where this calculation is done. But if we did it, in an encapsulated manner, and everything about a student was in one place, then the calculate GPA method would live just in one place. And so all I would have to do is change that. And then everywhere that used that method would um, be updated and be corrected. All right. Now granted, we're doing this simple with a die. All right, and there's not much a die, a die or a pair of dice can do. Right? A, dice ha a die has a value. You can roll the die. You can ask for its value. And you can get the name of the image that belongs to that. Really not a whole lot you can do other than that. But the idea is this is encapsulated here. All right. If we later wanted to expand this to allow for multiple-sided die besides the standard six, this would be the place to do it. Somehow, either in this, we could, we could either do it in this class or have another uh, class that inherited from this class. But this would be the place, all right, in some means that we would handle that. All right. So, public class. Our attribute, which is private, because we don't want anyone missing, messing with the innards of this, 
They need to go through the methods. We have a method to roll, a method to tell what the value is, and finally a method to get the image. Yes? Yes. All right. Java has constructors. Uh, what constructors are, are uh, is code that runs when the class, or when the object is created. So you can do like initialization. Pardon me? Well, you can set default values. Um, for example, we could have a, const you know, and this is getting a little ahead of ourselves, but we could have a constructor that created a six-sided die, and then we could have a constructor that accepted an argument of the number of sides, and then we could um, call that constructor and initialize it differently. All right, so constructors are code that happens Initialization code. Let's just think of it that way. And again, there's really nothing we need to initialize in this case, so we don't really have any um, initialization code. If you do not put in a constructor, if you do not put in any constructor, the Java compiler generates for you a no argument constructor that simply does a memory allocation and so on. doesn't do any initialization. Questions about this die class? Pretty straightforward. It's meant to be, this is our software representation of a single die. Everything about a single die ought to be contained in here. All right. We then have our class that uses this. And I talk a lot, and I talk about like people using your class and all that. I'm not talking about like users. I'm talking about other classes using it, other developers using it. Now, it might be you just on a different day, right? We created the die class, and then we are going to, to use it. But again, that's what I mean when I say using it. And we don't want people to be able to go in and directly access the attributes, because they could mess it up. All right? OK. What do we have on here on our onCreate? We set our content view. All right, that's what this does. That displays the screen. We grab a pointer to the button using that statement, which we went over several times. Find the thing in our layout that has this as an ID. It's a button, by the way, so treat it like a button. And store a pointer to that button in the variable called P. For that button, for that specific button, this class is going to serve as the onClick listener. In other words, this class this main activity is going to have the onClick method that's going to handle what happens when that button gets clicked. All right. We're able to do that because we've implemented onClick listener and because this class indeed has an onClick method inside of it. All right. What do we do in the onClick method? Well, we initialize the total of the dice. We set a Boolean whether they won or lost. We create our two dice objects. All right. Remember, the class is a template. The class is sort of the idea of this is what a die can have and can do. All right. When we create an object, we're actually creating individual instances of that. So here, we're defining what it means to be a die. All right. A die has a value. A die can be rolled. We can ask the die for what its value is. We can ask the die for the image associated with it. Here, we're actually creating two die. All right, our pair of dice that we're going to roll. Why, I, pardon me? Why are we overriding again? Repeat that, please. What is the overriding for the Oh, it, that's just a comment that goes in. We could get rid of that. All right. Die one and die two, we have our two dies here. This rolls them. All right. What does a roll do? It randomly generates a number. All right. And it returns the result. All right. In our case, what is the return value of 
the die roll method? Well, it's the value of the thing that we rolled. So D1 and D2 contain the two rolls of the dice. We sum them up. We grab pointers to the images. We grab pointer to the spinner, a pointer to the text view. We go through the rule evaluation that says if they won or not. If they, if they got the guess right, we set that B1 validate, um, um, Boolean rather. Then we set the text and we set the images. Okay. What are we going to take out of this? Let's, let's go through section at a time. We're going to take out this total variable. Yep. All right. We're going to take out the Boolean for B1. Actually not. We're just going to set it in a different way. We're going to set it from the method that we're going to call on our class. We're going to take out the two dice. Yes. All right. Are we going to take out the roll of the dice? Yes. Are we going to take out the summing of the dice? Yes. Are we going to keep this code in here? Yes. Yeah, we need to because we need our user interface to report the results of what that class did. All right. Is this code going to stay? Absolutely not. All right. <laughs> Absolutely, this code will not stay. Because that's the rule of the game, right? This, if, if anything, this is like the most likely thing to leave because this is what determines whether they won or lost the game. This is the rule for that game. Now, B1, we're still going to keep, remember. We're just going to set it different way. We're, going to, we're just going to set it as a result of our function call. Okay? And then finally, setting the image name, all right, we are going to do just in a little bit different way, all right. Since we're removing the dice object from here, from the onClick uh, on, uh, method, all right, we are um, not going to have the dice object to pull the image name from. We're going to have to ask the game object. So, I'm going to create a class, and let's talk about what's going to be in that class. Remember, I mean, yeah, this is an Android developing class, but this is also a programming class, right? And the issue isn't merely how you do stuff in Android, but how you write good programs. So I'm hoping this supports other classes that you had and reviews these concepts because these concepts don't always come through the first time that you view them. Sometimes it takes seeing them over and over again to make some headway on this. So I'm going to create a class called High Low Game. All right. What attributes will this class have in it? Pardon me? Um, it could have a total. The total could just be a return value from, uh, it, the total could just be part of the calculation. Does it need to tell anyone what the total of the dice is? Actually not. It just needs to tell if, if you won or lost. All right. Again, that could just be a return value. Yeah. So we could make it. Yeah, that's, that's more, uh, more of what I'm thinking of. We, we we're going to need a couple of dice. All right. All right. I'm thinking we need three methods. One of the methods, we could do this in... We could do this in, this is like the old TV show, Name That Tune. I can name that tune. I can write that class in three. I'm thinking we need three methods. The one should be obvious. The other two might not be quite as obvious. What do you think the obvious method we need is? 
Well, that's not a method, really. Roll the dice is part of the method, right? What do you do with games? You play them, right? So we need a play. Alright. Now, what is that going to return? Whether you won or lost. Alright. And what data type would be best for that? A boolean. There's no tying in this game. Right? Yeah. This game either won or lost. Alright? So, we have a boolean, we have a, a method called play that returns a boolean. What argument does this need? Does this need any arguments? To play the game. They wouldn't have a different answer. So it must be yes, in other words. Yeah. What are, well, so let me rephrase it. What argument does it need? All right. Well, the, the dice, the dice are attributes here. We don't need to pass into this method. We already have our dice here. Argument is the choice that the user made. Right. So, and then what is the logic of this? Uh, we're not going to write Java code, but like, let's just write pseudocode. Roll the dice. Total the dice. Then have your if statements to compare the total with what the user picked. And then finally return the result. In a nutshell, that's what we're going to do with this, right? In other words, you know, we've done this once, right? We're just moving where we're doing this code. So our code isn't going to look drastically different than this. We could take some of that over there. All right. There are some things specific to the UI. Remember, when we create a class, we want that class to be able to be used with any UI. All right? So therefore, the choice in this case is coming from a spinner control. We could easily imagine doing this game and having a different interface where there were radio buttons. Right? Or that this is being done as part of a web application and not an Android app, and we're using the same code to handle that. All right? If we were to do that, then we can't pass in a spinner control, right? There aren't no spinner controls in the web world. There's something like them, but there isn't them. But, pardon me? So we're going to pass an in in. That, that's how we're going to represent the choice 0, 1, and 2. All right? What we're trying to do here is we're trying to pull the user interface apart from the problem domain logic, the business logic, so that there's no linkage, there's no binding, coupling. There's an, is there another term I'm, I'm trying to think? Uh, I think binding and, and coupling uh, are the two uh, words that I want here. There's no real connection between the two. They're separate entities, and the way they communicate is via method calls. All right? So there's no code in my class that's going to look at the user interface. And there's no code in my UI code that's going to look at the innards of the class. All it knows is, when I play this game, I give it an integer, and I get back a Boolean. All right? That's all it knows. It has no idea what the... the the UI has no idea what the rules of the game are. That's encapsulated in the game. And then we can use this elsewhere, again, in, a, in maybe a web app or something like that. Now, think about this for a second. Think of the power of that. If we abstract all those rules and put them in its own place, we could actually make, with one user interface, the ability to play a bunch of different dice games, right? Simply by having a selector to select what rules you want to play by, which game are you playing, and then our UI would call the appropriate, um, 
call the appropriate um, game, pass the appropriate choices over, and would be good to go. Okay, so that's the, that's the obvious method. What do you do with games? You play them. So we need a play method. What are the other two methods that we need? I'll, I'll tell you those. Uh, pardon me? Well, this gets passed in the choice. So we already know the choice. We need, we, we, may, we will eventually need a score. All right? We will eventually need a score, but we're not tallying the score yet. But we can come back and add that in later on. What we need is we need two methods to get the image of the dice. Okay? Because remember, if we're moving the dice code out of here, we, if we're getting rid of these, we can no longer down here ask for the name of the dice. All right? So we have to do one of two things. We could handle this one or two different ways. And again, which way is better? I don't know. Six of one, half does the other. I could write a method that returns the dice object. And then the UI could ask the dice object for the name of the image. Or I could write a routine that returns each of the two images. Give me the image for dice one, give me the image for dice two. And it would return the string that contains the name. Yes? Remember, we don't want to make our properties public. So we don't want the outside world to access the properties. So what you're saying is we could make a property in the class for image. You could return an object. You are correct. In other words, I could make a high, I could make a whole nother class that was a high low results yeah. class. All right? And that high low results class would contain the Boolean that says, did they win or lose? The image for dice one, the image for dice two, and maybe what their current score was. Um, I'm not ready to do the, make that leap right now. All right? But yes, I, I didn't quite understand what you were saying at first. Yes, you're absolutely correct. You could do it that way. All right. Returning a, an object is how you get around the, the issue that you could only return one thing. Right? Uh, a function could only return one thing. It can return one of something. All right? But that something can be complicated. And that something can be an object that has a bunch of attributes and methods associated with it. All right? So yes, we could do that, and I'll have to decide if I want to go down that path or not. All right, we'll, we'll see like what time I wrap up with this piece of it, and maybe doing a few other things and so on, and, and we'll go from there. All right, so let's go and let's make this happen. I'm going to go here into and create new what do you mean by reference you have to you do have to remember that C sharp is a copy of Java uh, that's not what the wall is okay, okay. <laughs> no, yeah I just didn't know if, if that was one of the different subtle differences Uh, any object that you pass is passed by reference. So yes. A, um, a primitive that you pass, 
I believe is passed by value. I don't know if you can make it pass by reference. Bad code in my mind. Yeah, bad, 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 a bad practice to do that. Be because again, it's like um, the whole idea of a function is a function serves as a black box. A black box, you have known inputs and known outputs. The inputs come in, the outputs go out. Um, now, if I pass an object into a, if I pass an object as an argument and I change something about that object, yes, I'm changing the original object. All right, that's one of the implications of Java. But like to do that with like primitives to get around that is sort of a bad idea. All right. So I'm going to make my class called Hilo Game. Um, I think that's all I need to do. Finish. Uh, I will put in my attributes. Die D1 equals new die. That's actually calling a constructor. Even though we don't have one coded, right, a construct, you know, is, is like an attorney. If you don't have an attorney, one will be provided for you, all right? If you do not have a constructor, the compiler provides one for you. So here's our second one. So I'll go and create my method. I'm going to make these private, by the way. They're in the same package. That's how I know. That's how it knows. Die one refers to this die, instead of if we were writing an app for a funeral home, some other die that lives somewhere. Yes. I think we're talking apples and oranges here. There's no benefit. The only reason that you import something, like let's let's look here. Let's look in the die. Only reason I import that is so I don't have to do this. If I do that, I don't even need to import it. So all that import does is it is allows you to refer to classes by just their class name and not their package name and class name. By importing it, it says, hey, the random that I'm talking about is not some other random class that could be floating out my application. It is a random class that is in Java Util. So when I say random, I really mean Java Util random. That's all that importing does. And in this case, the assumption is that it is in the same package, so I don't have to say it. All right. Okay. So now I'm going to create a method public boolean play is going to accept an argument of an integer. And again, we're going to uh, apply by the convention that zero means um, that they picked low, one means they picked seven, two means they picked high. I'm going to define my Boolean. B result. Remember I said the code works better if I assume they lost and then check to see if they've won. All right. You could write the code either way, but it, um, the code is more straightforward if you do it this way. So I'm going to assume they lost All right, and return that. OK. Now, now I'm going to put the code in in between to actually do the work. 
So I'm going to declare it in an integer for total. I am going to roll my two dice. And I could do this a bunch of different ways. Um, I'm going to say this, and I hope it isn't confusing. All right. This rolls the dice, takes the return value, and adds it to the return value of the second dice. So remember, the return value of the die is the value that we rolled. Okay? So I'm rolling that those two die, taking the value that they returned and adding it together. All right? Other thing I could do I could do this. Doesn't do any. We've, we've called the function, it returns a value, but we are not saving the return value, so the return value is lost. Well, we do need it eventually, so I could do this. All right. Or, another thing I could do would be to have... I hope one of these makes sense to you. Yeah. Well, not really, just trying to be thorough. Oh, it doesn't want to be D1. We'll say V1 for value. And I could say total equals V1 plus V2. Oops. All right. Any of those are acceptable ways of doing it. We roll the dice, we grab their values. All right. I'm going to go back to this and say total equals... D1 roll plus D2 roll. All right, that seems to be the most straightforward. Roll the two dice, that's what those methods are. Take the return value, that is take the value that the dice rolls, add it together, and that's my total. Now I'm going to have a string of if statements. Repeat that, please. Could you do a private method only for that slide speed for itself? I'm not sure I'm following. What would I use the method, private method for? The decision logic. I guess I could, but um, if it was longer code than this, I would say, yeah, let's go and do that. So, yeah, I could do that, but in this case, um, it is simple enough. Uh, a guideline I've heard, and this might be a little distorted because of the way the screen is set up and all that, but ideally you can see an entire method on one screen. That if your method goes, if you have to scroll to read the method, your method is too big. All right. Um, let's see. I don't have that. I do want instead arg choice.
So again, I look at this, I can see the whole method on my screen. All right? And again, you can, you know, depending on how big your monitor is and how you have these boundaries drawn and all that, there'll be a little variance for that. But the idea kind of is, if you can see it on one, string, uh, on one screen, you can get your head around it. <laughs> all right? And if it goes between screens, then you're scrolling back and forth as like, what was B1 again? And, and all that, and it gets to be confusing. So that would be the guideline that I would say about putting it in a separate function. Yeah, I could. I could make this a private function. I could put that down there. I could call that function. But the whole process is short enough that there really wouldn't be any benefit of that. Okay? So um, I'm not going to... I'm not going to do it in this case. Now, what am I going to do? I'm going to create my other two methods, public string get image1. And what does it do? Well, it simply calls dice1 get image name. And then get image two will return the second dies image. All right. Now I just as well could have returned D1 and D2. I could give back to the UI, here's a die, do what you want with it. But that doesn't really seem like a good idea to me. All right. I don't want someone, I don't want the UI rolling my die. All right, it doesn't seem to be right. That's my, that's the game's die. All right, I don't want, it's not the UI's die. So, yeah, the UI has a right to know the image. I'll tell it the image. <laughs> it's funny how we personify these things, you know. It, it, I mean, that goes back to my first computer uh, teacher who would always, like, speak like you're talking to the computer and asking it to do this. This, by the way, is an OO technique called delegation. All right, in other words, I ask the game for the image, the game turns around and asks the die what your image is. So it's like the UI is going to ask the game, give me the first dice image. The game is going to say, hey, D1, give me your image. It's going to get it, and then it's just going to turn around and give it back. So there's no real code here other than to ask one of its members, one of its attributes, for this particular function call. This whole thing, this is called composition, all right? In other words, a game consists of these components, these parts, these two dies. Let me bring this one up in Notepad so that we can take a closer look and see if you have any questions. All right, public class high-low game. Its attributes are the two die. So as soon as we create this class, we create our die objects. We have one method that is a Boolean that returns whether they have won or lost. All right? True or false. And the play method accepts the user's choice because that's what it needs to do its thing. This high-low game, you can't just say, well, I want to play the game. Well, you've got to say, well, I want to play the game and my choice is that it's going to be high or my choice is seven or whatever. It's necessary to play the game, the user's choice. It's like calling a coin flip, all right? You know, you'd have to say, you know, I want heads, I want tails. All right, have my result variable that I initialize to, tr to false. I have a total that I compute by rolling the two dice, taking their values, and summing them up. I then have my logic that implements the rules of the game that looks at the user's choice, that looks at the um, total um, and determines whether they've won or not, and then I've returned the results. I then have two methods to get the two images that I call and get the image for die one, image for die two. Oh. Yeah, I'm using the method of the die, right. Exactly.
All right. And again, these are instances. These are particular dices. I don't, uh, particular dies. So I'm calling the method on the appropriate object. For image one, I'm calling the method on D1. For image two, I'm calling it on the second die, D2. All right. So let's go in and let's make this now call that method. Get rid of this. Get rid of this. B1, I'm going to get to, I'm going to go and create Did I win or lose? I don't know. I'm going to ask the game. Game dot play. And what do I pass? Well, I need to pass in the option that the user picked. Where is the option that the user picked? It's stored in that spinner. It's the selected item position. Remember that selected item position is going to be a 0, a 1, or a 2. So I'm calling this and I'm giving it the selected item position. So I'm giving it the appropriate value. Don't need any of this. If I'm 1, display the win message. If I've lost, display the lose message. Okay? Now, notice that, uh, well, I just totally lost my train of thought. Oh, notice that it's the UI's job to display the appropriate message, right? We could represent a win to the user a whole bunch of different ways, right? We could make a little animation of a guy jumping up and down all happy if they've won and an animation of someone lowering their head and walking off dejectedly if they've lost. That would be one way that we could represent whether they won or lost. Another way we can represent whether they won or lost is by displaying a text message. You've won, you've lost. All sorts. So you, we could play a sound if they won and play a different sound if they lost. So the bottom line is the game's job isn't to handle that UI detail. In other words, what happens when I win? What happens when I lost? Well, different UIs may choose to implement that in a different way. The point is, is that's not part of the game. That's part of the UI. So therefore, the fact that I get back the answer of whether I've won or lost, all right, I let the UI decide how it's going to represent that to the user. And in this case, I pull that text string, which again is, is going to be, um, you know, depending on the resource file and the resource qualifier, um, it could be multilingual and it could display the answer, you know, based on the language set for the device. Okay, now my last step is I got to get the name of the image, and the name of the image is in the game object. Get image one, and the game object, get image two. So. Let's look at what this has become. That's not what I want to, that, I want to keep this one. This is the one I want to do.
Not much code left in here. We create our object. All the code that's here really is just related to UI things. In other words, what is UI? UI is a means of gathering input to supply to this. And it's a means of displaying the output, the results back to the user. So really, ever, all the code in here is related to gathering the input, displaying the output. The work of this, the, the game logic of how to tell if you've won or lost, is entirely encapsulated within the game class. So, I have a boolean that says whether they won or lost. I create my game object. I grab pointers to these different things in the UI because I'm going to need to put stuff in them. All right? I call the game play method and I give it the option that the user has chosen. If they've won, I do one thing. If, I've lost, if they lost, I've done something else. Notice there's no logic here that says what it means to win or lose. I'm simply taking the word of that game object that, hey, they won, they lost. The determination is entirely made within the game object. And then the last thing I want to do, again, is a UI thing. All right? So our button click event only contains UI things. Gathering the input, calling the appropriate method, and then doing something with the result. So there should be a lot less code in here than in version 1 or version 2. All right, least code of all in this version because all this does is stuff relating to the UI. Gathering the input, displaying the output. Yes. Yes. Question about it? Excellent question. One that I'm not going to answer right now. Well, in this case, the answer is more like I'm going to answer it in maybe five or ten minutes. Okay? So it's not like wait until next week. This isn't a cliffhanger. Although I've often thought, like, maybe that's a good way to keep students interested is, is run my class like the old TV show Alias, where like the last five minutes of it, the person's in a predicament that it looks like they're going to meet a certain doom, and then tune in next week. And then you know they get out of it, right? Because otherwise, like, the next week's episode would be like a five-minute show of Alias. Like, that's it. <laughs> they lost. The bad guys won, you know. Evil runs the world now. Of course you know that they're going to, but you don't know how. But anyhow, this is going to be a cliffhanger. We'll, just, we'll go over that in, in a couple minutes. I just want to run this to make sure it works, first of all. All right? Yeah, because all, all this, this fancy talking doesn't do me any good if this code doesn't work. So let's go and let's run this guy. It's, co it's stuff that gets generated. In other words, it's the results of the compile. All right. I pick low, I hit play. I rolled an 8 and I lost. Pick low and play. Rolled a 10, I lost. Rolled a 9, I lost. Rolled an 8, I lost. Rolled a 5, I won. Okay. So we would want to test this. And again, it's kind of tricky testing when you have randomization because how do you know how much that you test? But you'd want to make sure that you've picked low and low was obtained and you won. You pick low and low was not obtained and you lost. And you'd want to test the edge cases too, like seven. Make sure that seven doesn't count as a low or a high, that it only counts as a seven. So you want to be pretty thorough in your testing.
Repeat that, please. Did I? Right. That would be in the die class. I, I, I generated a random number from 0 to 6, and then I added 1 to it. I'm sorry, I generate a random number from 0 to 5, and then I added 1 to it. Because next int will give me a number from 0 to 5, and then I add 1. Alternatively, I could have said 1, 7. And that will give me a random number between 1 and 6. All right? That's why people say, you know, if programmers around the world, things that no it wouldn't, because that's crazy. That's not intuitive at all, right? But that's the way it works. All right. So there's a question about the lifetime. How long do these objects live? All right. This gets into, I don't want to listen to Amazon Music. What did I click that for? All right. In a nutshell, a method that is uh, an object that is created within a method is only alive as long as that method is running. So, in other words, if I click the button, it's going to create a game object. It's going to play the game. It's going to tell me whether they won or lost. It's going to display it. When that method is done, that game object is gone. Okay? The game object is gone. All right? Now, that's not always a good thing, right? In this case, if we're playing individual games, it really doesn't matter if we have a new one or an old one. But, if we had, we're going to keep track of the person's score. All right, and we want to start them off with a hundred points, let's say, and if they won, would follow the payoff rules, and we would um, we would um, increase by either one or four if they won, would decrease by one if they lost. Okay, if we want to do that, all right then we, would n we could not declare it within the onClick event. Because if we declared it in the onClick event, it would die after the onClick event finished run ran running. All right? Jesse said the word garbage collection. All right? Here's what garbage collection is. Pardon me? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just trying to see the context. I, I suppose that's right in the sense that if I declare something within a method, it dies in the, in the method. That might be one of the tiers. If I just declare something as part of the class, it will be alive as long as that class is alive and so on. As a general rule, all right, here's what happens when you create an object. We go uh, into this in more detail in the Java class, but uh, an introduction is worthwhile. If I have a statement, high low game G equals new high low game. All right. Effectively, that's two statements. High-low game G and G equals new 
high low gain. And I've just combined it into one statement by doing that. All right? What does this part of the statement do? It creates a, me uh, a location in memory called G. Specifically, it creates it in a place called the stack. This is a different place of memory, different, different section of memory. It's called the stack. So if I say high low game G, I've created a variable called G, because all a variable is is a memory location that has a name. All right? We put it somewhere so we can get it back later, <laughs> right? We store the result, the total of the dice, of being dice one plus dice two, in a variable called total, because later on we want to do something with total, and we want to remember where we put it, right? So we give it a name, and we said, well, that's total. So that's all that, 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 that variables are, our memory locations that have names, that we can put things in, and then later on get things out. So high, low, game, G, creates a memory location called G, and in it, we are going to store a pointer to a high-low game object. So we can't put anything else in there. All right? It's restricted because we said high-low game G. So G, we've created a memory location where we're going to put a pointer eventually to a high-low object. Well, that's what this line does. This says G, that high-low object, equals a new high-low game. The new high-low game part of it, what it does is it creates a high-low object. High-low game object, it creates it in the heap. The heap is where objects live. All right? So it creates it, and it creates all the attributes and methods associated with it, and so on and so forth. And so I have that living in the heap. And this variable g points to the location in memory. I'll just arbitrarily make up the, the value 100. That's in memory spot 100. Okay? So the question of how long does that live? How long is that out in the heap? It's out in the heap as long as someone is pointing to it. All right? Now, in this case, we look here. You've talked about scope of variables in other classes, right? Okay. So, this variable B1 has a scope of inside this method, right? Yes. Scope is who can see the variable, all right? So for example, Boolean B1 is a variable that's declared in the onClick event. Because it's declared in the onClick event, I can't access it in any other event. No other event can see it. No other method can see it. So if I go into here and I put... b1 equals false, I get an error. Doesn't know what b1 is, because b1 is declared in this. So this has the scope of this method. So it can be seen in this method. Now notice these things up here, which I can get rid of now. Let's look at my high-low gain. These attributes are declared as part of the class. So I can use them anywhere within the class. All right? I can use D1 in this method. I can use D1 in this method. I can use D2 in this method. I can use D2 in this method. Because they're declared outside of any method. These kind are sometimes called instance variables. In other words, there's a value of them for each instance of the object. And because they're instance variables, I can use them anywhere 
in my code. Alright? In any method. Alright? Now, if we get back to our game class here, that is also declared within the method. So that variable game has scope only within that method. So, okay. Take care. If I tried to access that here, don't know what game is. All right, because it was declared inside of this. Ah, now, here's the thing, all right? Remember our whole idea of like how long does an object live? If I declare this variable g inside the onClick method, when that onClick method is done, this variable g disappears. So nothing is pointing to that object. That object is sitting out in memory, but nothing can access it. That's where garbage collection comes in. What garbage collection is, is periodically, the Java virtual machine goes and gets rid of any object that no one points to. Because it's useless. You can't refer to it. There's no variables that point to it, so you can't do anything with it. If you wanted to do something with it, too bad. There's no way to access it. It's, it's dead to you. you know, it sounds like a gangster movie or something. It's dead to, it's dead to your program. All right. So what that means is this object is gone. The next time I click on it, the whole cycle repeats itself. I create a new, a brand new game object. I do my thing with it. The onClick method finishes, that variable g or game or whatever it's called disappears, and that object then is garbage collected. Well, if we want to keep track of someone's score, that's not going to work. Because each time we're going to start with a new game. All right, so whatever our initial value is for their score, each time is going to say that that's what their score is. So the bottom line is, is we can't declare that as part of the click event. What we can do is we can make it an attribute of this class. Yeah. So I'm going to put that up here. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes, I, sometimes they do, and and I don't know if they're dozing off or they're abused by the fact that that you know, he's talking and no one can see it or what. But um, not a whole class, no. Maybe a couple minutes at most. Usually, I end up noticing. A uh, good thing is, is like that screen behind me, I can see what it is, and and sometimes this guy, I can see what it is. All right. Yeah, I think they're there for another class. Um, okay, so I declare this up here, and now it's available, and what's more, because I declared it outside the method, it gets created when this class gets created, and it's not going to die until this class dies. Yes? The main activity the whole application, right? The main act, well, is not, in, in this case, it's our whole application, because our whole application only contains one activity. But yeah, they're, they're Pardon me. Other cases, there can be multiple activities within an application. Well, main activity would be the one that's, that when the app starts, that's what fires off. All right. So, now we created it here. Now, this has a different scope. I can access it anywhere through here. All right. And so what I could do, does anyone mind if I go a little over today? No? Okay. What I could do is I could actually keep track of the score. 
All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a couple of things. I'm going to create an instance variable in here for the score. And we'll start them off with a thousand points. I'm going to automatically deduct one, and if they win, I'm going to add two. Just makes the code easier. Except for picking seven, I'm going to actually add five. Because if you, you, should, get, you should be up four if you pick seven. You should be up one if you pick low, up one if you picked high, down one if you lose. So this is the most straightforward way I can think of doing that. I'm going to add a method that says get score. Public int get score. And what is it going to do? It is going to simply return the score. Again, that's an, score is an instance variable. It's declared outside of any method, so any method can use it. What am I doing here? Oh, no. Eclipse died unexpectedly. Probably. Good news is I do have the code in yeah, in, in text edit, so. Okay. Pardon me? Okay, fortunately, I didn't lose much. I probably have to go in here and move, yeah. Let's move that back up here. All right. Pardon me? Yeah, now we, we want to display the score. So what do we have to do to do that? All right, first thing we have to do is go in the XML and create another text field. Um, I'm not going to put a label on it, just in the interest of time. But if I did, we would want to put, like in the values, we'd want to put a string literal for that. So I'm going to go here, 
And I'm going to make a text view. I'll call it score. Um, it would have at some point, I'm sure. All right. So we can go and do that. All right. Now, what do I want to do? I want to display it when, when I initially start this, and then I want to display it after every game. Okay? So, what I'm going to do is in my activity, I'm going to create a text view. called TXT score. Why do you think I created it up here? I haven't done that yet. I've created, in the past when I've referred to these buttons or the spinner, I've created it in the method. Why do you think I'm creating it up here? Persistence. In other words, I want to, I want to be able to access this from a couple different places. I want it to be an, is, uh, uh, an instance variable and not, not only have scope within there. So what I want to do is I want to set it initially, all right, and then I want to set it after every game. So I'll go here and say txt score equals text view. Oops. Find view by id r dot id dot and what did I call that? Score? Well, that's what I called this. What did I call, what id did I give it? Score. Yes. That is a good question. I think in some cases it brings it back to life. When you, when you bring it back to life. We'll have to, we'll have to go over that. Um, like if I minimized it and brought it back, I think it would run on create again. Um, it does not recognize score. I think if I compile this, it will take care of it. So. Let me go and All right. Why didn't I just hard code 1,000 in the text view? Why did I put in the onCreate method to grab the value from the class? Right. I, if I were to change it and say, okay, you don't start with 1,000, you start with 500. That's a rule of the game. So I'm, I want that in the game class as opposed to the UI. If I change it in, 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 in if I hard a 1,000 in there, if I decide to 500, I have to change it in two places. All right. 
No, it will not run on create after I click the button. So I'm going to have to go and put this code down here as well. So this takes care of initially running it when the game starts, and this will, will take care of it after I, oops, I don't need to do that again. Now I could have had two text views, one to use in this method and one to use in this method, but because I'm going to use a text view in both methods, why not make it an instance variable? Yes? You had a question? Yes, but the variable is declared outside of it. So the variable has scope. All right, let's run this. An error. No. Text score is declared up here. So that, I, that, that doesn't create the object, it creates a pointer. This points to this thing and saves it there. All right, high low game equals new high low game set. So let's see. XT score. No. Let's, first of all, let's see if we're getting any error messages down here that we're missing. And sure enough, we are. Try to do this systematically. I could do it this way. I'm going to comment that line out. I've added two lines of code on the on create. So which one is making it blow up? Okay, 
I comment that out and it does not give me an error. All right. So let's put that back in. Run it again. It down and blows up. So this is the offending party. Pardon me? Yeah, the problem is go. Put a hundred in here. That's going to work. All right. Problem, I'm sure, I'm reasonably sure now is a data type issue. All right. So I hard code 100 in there. It works. It's, it's, it'll blow up. Boom. Because that's the line of code that's offensive is this one here. So my problem is that I probably need to move this and set this to string. Um, so integer get score is returns an int, I need to convert an int to a string, so Java convert. All right. Thank you. Pardon me? Okay, I'm I'm I was only half listening to you, so <laughs> So give me a second here and then we'll try to I'm guessing that this is our problem and Now it works. Low. Lost. Pick seven. Lost. 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 It didn't do the implicit conversion for it. I had to explicitly convert it to, um, I, I had to explicitly convert it to string. It, it, it did not implicitly do the conversion from an integer to a string. All 
All right. So, yeah, I was kind of surprised at that. I would have thought that that would have given me a compile error, if anything, because it knew that that method returned a integer. I'm not sure why. If it can't accept an integer, why didn't it just tell me it can't accept an integer? Why did it let me go and run it? And I mean, it knew it was an integer because it knows that that's the return value of that method. So I'm not really sure. But um, once I saw that was the thing that was blowing up, it, I was pretty sure that that was the issue. But again, like I said in my morning class, if your code isn't working, don't act like you know what's wrong with it, right? Because if you knew what was wrong with it, it would be working. <laughs> So, all right, I will post this example um, in a bit along with the video. All right. Are you sticking around for yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Like I have a secret. That's be how to do it. How can you make a style? I guess, yeah. All right. So far, I tried to implement in the code, but nothing seems to work. Create a custom adapter with a layout for your spinner. Yep, seems to be. I'm going to use the bathroom, and I'll be right back.